I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE number 12933, and I'd like to welcome you to the first part of a multi-video look at static routing. We're going to talk a little bit about the theory of static routes here, but I'm also going to give you some real-world tips on how to use static routes in real-world networks, and also answer a couple of common questions that I'm often asked in my courses. When students learn about RIP and EIGRP and OSPF, they tend to say, well, if these are so great, you know, why do I ever need to use a static route? And we're going to address that in a moment, but I just want to remind you, when we talk about static routes, well, static is compared to what? And they're static as compared to those routing protocols I mentioned a moment ago, OSPF and EIGRP and RIP. And those protocols can discover new networks and calculate the best paths to those networks with minimal input from you and I as network admins. Where unfortunately with static routing, as our network grows, and it always does, we generally have to visit every router in the network, and I say generally, it depends on the topology, but you and I then as network admins, we've got to go out and make sure all our routers have the best information to get packets to that new network. And where with dynamic routing protocols, when all goes well, that information is dynamically spread across the network. With static routing, you and I, as that network admin, we've got to visit each router. So it's not a terribly scalable choice when it comes to static routing. Another issue with static routing is that with dynamic routing protocols, they're also going to quickly detect down networks and adjust the routing table accordingly. And we tend to forget about that. Dynamic routing protocols aren't just for discovering new networks and then spreading the word across the network dynamically. They're also for detecting down networks and also changes in the network topology. If you move a subnet in your network, your dynamic routing protocols will adjust the routing table accordingly, where static networks and static routes will not do that. Again, you and I as network admins, we've got to go to the routers and make those changes. And the larger your network gets, as far as the number of routers, the harder it is to keep up with static routing. So you hear all this, and the natural question is, well, why do I need them? You know, beyond knowing them for your exams, of course, why do I need to know about static routing? Well, static routes can serve as an excellent bandage or tourniquet, depending on how bad the problem is, when a routing issue arises. Because as we all know, when an end user calls and says, hey, I can't get to the web server, can't get my email, etc., they're not really interested in the details, right? They couldn't possibly care less. They don't really want to hear, well, you know, we're redistributing these two protocols and we're trying to figure out why only the odd ones are going in. They don't care. They just want to be able to do their work. And that's understandable. And we want them to be able to do their work. And also when they can, that lessens the load on us because we don't have to keep answering the phone. We can actually troubleshoot, right? We've all been there. So we can put a static route, a well-placed static route in our network perhaps a default static route, and which will allow the users to do their work, and then they're not calling us, and then we're actually able to troubleshoot the dynamic routing issue. So static routes do come in handy in the real world. Another advantage of static routes is that static routes have no overhead. And you learn about overhead really when you're working on the CCNA because we've got EIGRP hello packets, we've got OSPF hellos, We've got RIP update packets. Every dynamic routing protocol has some kind of overhead. Well, in certain situations, a router doesn't need a huge routing table if it's only got one possible next hop for whatever it's sending. Let me show you what I'm talking about with that. In this particular case, this router does not need a full routing table for every external network that it may need to send packets to and every internal network. It doesn't need it. The only thing this particular router in this scenario needs is a default route to this router. Because this router is really the gateway, right? It's doing all the work. It's going to route the packets externally. It's going to route packets internally. But in this particular situation, no matter what packets this router is going to send, they're always going to this interface, right? They're always going to this router. So while some routing protocols, as you'll learn in more advanced studies, will allow us to configure this particular router to receive a default route from the routing protocol rather than a full routing table, we can also configure a default static route, and which will really do the same thing. 
Now the reason we do that is that we want our rounding table, as I said, to be complete, but we also want it to be concise. The smaller the routing table, really the more efficient the entire routing process is. So when we have a scenario such as this, where this router is always going to be sending packets to this one, no matter whether it's external or internal, again, there's no reason for this router to have a full routing table. It only needs a default route. The IP route command is used to create static routes, and that's whether they be a host route, a default route, or a more general route, say, to an entire subnet. And in the labs, we're going to look at all three of those scenarios. We'll configure a host route, we'll configure a default route, and we'll configure a more general route. And before we get to those labs, there's one thing I want to mention. Again, when I'm teaching a class, I'll often, or occasionally at least, have a student say, well, we use all static routes in our network, or we use you know, a lot of static networks. Is that necessarily bad? It's not necessarily bad. It's just not terribly scalable. I know of some networks that use nothing but static routing, and they function perfectly fine. So you know that's really up to the network admin. Overall, in most situations, and I, I guess that's enough disclaimers, uh, in most situations, you're going to want to run a dynamic routing protocol. But I can guarantee, whether it's on a Cisco certification exam or in the real world, or probably both, you're going to need to know how static routes work, what the syntax is, and exactly how to configure a default route. So we're definitely going to look at that in the next video in this series, which will be coming up very soon. If you're on YouTube, just look to the right under my name or CCIE12933. You'll see a list of videos. You'll see it there. If you're watching this on my website, just look for a link right under this video. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I invite you out to the website, www.thebryantadvantage.com. And I'm Chris Bryant, CCIE number 12933, and I will see you at the website.